Before we take a closer look at the anatomy of the brain and nervous systems, Let's stop for a moment and consider the ways in which scientists are helping psychologists understand human behavior a little bit better. Psychologists work hand in hand with a variety of other scientists so as to better understand humans and other animals. And as the functionalists noted, understanding an organism in its environment is an important part of gaining that better understanding. For psychologists, Environment isn't just the physical space in which an organism lives. It includes all influences external to the organism itself. Behavior geneticists are scientists who merge the study of an organism's genetics with its external influences. Behavior geneticists are crucial to continuing psychological research. So many animals, including humans, are social organisms, and our communities exert an enormous amount of influence on us. Behavior geneticists and psychologists can begin looking at an organism's traits even before birth. In mammals, for instance, the uterus is an example of an environment that is potentially influencing genetics and behavior. Then, from the moment an organism is born, countless additional influences are added. Temperament, a human's emotional excitability, is one of those personality traits which is potentially tied to environmental influences. Even prior to speaking, when an infant basically expresses itself primarily through different cries and sounds, temperament can be noted. Some babies are very excitable. They seem to cry whenever they perceive a change in their environment. Other babies are more easygoing. They seem to notice changes but aren't alarmed by them. Or, at the very least, they don't cry when they notice them. Obviously, we can study an individual's temperament we can even study multiple individuals of similar temperament and develop some conclusions about how their environment may have affected their genetics and thus their temperament. But what we can't ever do is determine exactly what percent of one's temperament is due to environmental factors and which percent is due to one's genetics. However, scientists can and do measure heritability in a population. Heritability is a statistic and remember, when we're talking statistics, we're talking about populations, about groups of people, and not individuals. Heritability measures the likelihood that individual genotypic differences account for the degree of variation of a specific phenotype in a population. In other words, heritability is a way of describing how much any given trait is related to genetic rather than environmental factors. It's a way of describing how genetic any given trait is. As your text notes, heritability has historically been determined from twin studies. Since identical twins share almost all of their genetic material while fraternal twins share 50% of their genetic material, twin studies allow researchers to determine the extent to which genetics influences specific phenotypic traits. Basically, if identical twins raised in the same environment exhibit a specific trait more regularly than fraternal twins do, then it seems obvious that genetics play a large role in the expression of that particular trait. Heritability is expressed on a spectrum from 0 to 1. The closer the heritability coefficient, denoted as h squared, is to 1, the greater the likelihood that genetics are entirely responsible for the trait in question. Conversely, a heritability variable close to zero would indicate that a trait has nothing to do with genetics and thus is mostly due to environment. Please note that heritability does not determine proportionality. That is, a heritability coefficient of 0.6 doesn't mean that the expression of a trait is 60% due to genetics and 40% due to environment. The heritability coefficient also doesn't determine which environmental factors play into the expression of a trait. In the modern search to better understand behavior, behavior geneticists are using molecular genetics, which, as the name implies, studies the molecular structure and function of genes in the hopes of identifying specific genes that influence behavior. Psychology's relatively recent focus on genetics is in part due to the work of the Human Genome Project and the ability of modern science to identify and research individual human genes. The trick, of course, 
has been the realization that most traits aren't the result of a single gene, but rather a group or team of genes that, together, exhibit a specific trait. Still, knowing this, psychologists can use molecular genetics to try and identify populations that might be at risk for certain traits which coincide with behaviors that may develop into clinical diagnoses. If, for example, behavior geneticists could identify a team of genes that predisposes one to anxious behavior, and then can identify a population at greater risk of anxious behavior, then medical professionals and psychologists might be able to target at-risk individuals with early therapies to sidestep more severe diagnoses later on. Of course, access to genetics research is very modern. Before having access to this research, psychologists looked primarily at environmental factors that might influence behavior. They focused on two main ones, culture and norms. In psychology, the term culture refers broadly not only to the values and traditions of a specific population, but also to that population's behaviors, ideas, and attitudes. All of these elements are passed down generationally and can become significant environmental influences on behavior. Each cultural group, in turn, develops its own rules for acceptable and expected behavior. These are called norms. Some cultural groups greatly resemble one another and their norms are similar. For instance, most cultural groups around the world frown on murder. However, sometimes one group's norms feel very strange. In some cultures, for instance, a child isn't supposed to meet an authority figure's eyes when speaking with them. This is a sign of respect for one's elders. But in the US and in other Western cultures, we're generally taught that we should look someone in the eye when we're speaking with them. You can sometimes see this mishmash of norms in odd places, like in this cartoon, showcasing the different ways people might react in international arrival gates. Since culture and norms play such a significant role in determining behavior, we must ask ourselves, how do culture and norms develop? Well, the study of evolutionary psychology examines the commonalities of organisms, in our case of humans. They look at the ways in which species have evolved over time and examine how those changes came to be. Evolutionary psychologists study both genetic and behavioral changes over time. This is very close to anthropological study that other social scientists engage in. Evolutionary psychologists do study differences in genetics. For instance, many animals display sexual dimorphism. This is when the two biological sexes are noticeably different sizes, usually when the male is larger than the female. Some hominid, human-like species also displayed exaggerated sexual dimorphism. Australopithecus afarensis, for instance, this is the species of the fossil Lucy, likely exhibited sexual dimorphism. Male fossils were much larger than female fossils. In modern humans, the difference in height between the biological sexes is negligible. Globally, modern human males average a height of 5 feet 6 inches, while females average a height of 5 feet 2 inches. In fact, there are relatively few differences between males and females of Homo sapiens sapiens, that's our species. We have all the same bones and muscles. Our organs are mostly the same. We obviously differ with regards to sexual organs. In fact, for archaeologists, it's often not until a pelvis is uncovered that the scientist knows whether the bones belonged to a male or a female. Notice on the slide, a female's ilium, the top of her pelvis, tends to be more butterfly-shaped than a male's. The ischium is also slightly different. Now, these differences accommodate for pregnancy and childbirth in females. All these similarities aside, Biological males and biological females do tend to present differently. For instance, the hormones specific to each sex ensure a generally hairier exterior for males and for females. And in females, the secondary sexual organs, the breasts, are much more obvious than they are in males. But that's about it. So why do human behaviors toward each sex seem to vary so much? Let's start with a quick review of the differences between biological sex and gender. 
A biological sex refers most specifically to the chromosomal designation of the sex chromosomes. Mothers always pass on an X chromosome, while fathers pass on either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. As you'll remember from your biology class, a person who has two X chromosomes is biologically female, while someone who has one X and one Y chromosome is biologically male. A person's sex chromosomes affect the production of the sex hormones that begin influencing the body during prenatal development. However, this is not always an exact match. For instance, the Y chromosome dictates the production of testosterone. Females have testosterone too, just much less than males. However, some females have testosterone levels similar to that of males, and some males never produce testosterone at the typical male level. So biological sex is coded in a person's genes as long as a person's sex hormones react in the typical way. Gender, however, is a social construct. That is, the concept of gender is affected by external influences, by culture and norms. Most societies, especially historically, have recognized two genders, male and female. These genders conveniently matched biological sex. Over time, cultural groups developed specific gender roles for each gender. These roles dictated expected behavior for males and for females. In prehistoric times, gender roles were likely tied both to perceived physical capability and to cultural expectations. For instance, one of the earliest examples of job specialization in human history was the hunter-gatherer designation. Generally speaking, males were hunters and females were gatherers. Why did this job differentiation develop? Well, Anthropologists believe that, since women were the primary caregivers to infants, they needed to stay near their camps in order to feed and nurture their mostly helpless young. A mother could carry her infant with her, and could monitor other children while gathering food near the camp. In prehistoric times, though, hunters often followed herds of large game long distances in order to be able to kill them. This meant that hunters had to be away from camp, sometimes for days at a time. If you have to breastfeed an infant, that absence is counterproductive to nurturing that infant. Men, who from a breastfeeding perspective are pretty useless, then became default hunters, while women, who often became mothers, specialized in gathering. Well, over time, cultures seem to have developed ideas of value about certain jobs. In any hunter-gatherer society, it's the gatherers who collect most of the group's food but it's the hunters who bring back the luxury foodstuff, the meat. So, cultures began to prize the work of hunters, and thus of men, over that of women. And, perhaps, this is where the concept of patriarchy first emerged. For most humans, our gender is assigned at birth, if not before, thanks to ultrasounds. From birth, our cultural group and the norms we learn further emphasize our gender and gender roles, and that often leads to a strong sense of gender identity, that is, an individual's sense of being male or female. Studies show that an individual's gender identity and their understanding of their gender role in society is apparent in early childhood. Gender typing, an individual's adoption of expected gender roles, usually happens after determining gender identity, and it also starts early. Look at the picture on the screen. When shown a doll exhibiting typically female characteristics, long hair and breasts, a young child will categorize that doll as female and ascribe all sorts of behaviors to that doll. It should wear a dress. It should like the color pink. It should prefer to play with other dolls rather than with a truck or a gun, etc. It's actually kind of alarming how certain young children are with regards to expected gender roles. Social learning theory explains that children pick up so many of their norms, including gender roles, from observing and imitating those around them. This theory was developed by Albert Bandura, a psychologist you'll learn more about in our unit on learning. Social learning theory holds that children begin to develop their gender identity in part from connecting with the same gender parent and imitating the behaviors they see exhibited. In a gender-normed family, a little boy might recognize that daddy likes to play with a ball sometimes, and he might mimic that behavior by tossing around a ball. He hears someone comment, 
Oh, look, he's trying to dribble the ball like daddy. How cute. And those words serve as a reinforcement of his behavior dribbling the ball, not to mention serving as a reinforcement that a sport like basketball is played by males. By the time a child is school aged, their gender identity and gender typing is pretty much set. A second theory, gender schema theory, associates social learning theory with cognition. Studies have shown that infants, very young humans, can recognize the difference between typically male and female voices and faces. As they begin to learn language, toddlers start to understand that certain words describe them, he versus she, and thus they begin to organize their entire concept of the world through a gender-specific schema. This theory proposes that as children are exposed to more gender-specific words, they begin to adapt their behavior accordingly. In other words, gendered language can reiterate gender roles and gender identity. So what happens when biological sex and gender don't coincide? This dissonance is a reality for some people today and some cultural groups are currently engaged in a continuing conversation with people whose gender doesn't match their biological sex. These individuals often struggle to create a space for themselves in communities where, historically, only a male-female paradigm has existed. Or is that even true? Is it only now in the contemporary world that there are people whose gender don't match their biological sex? In your world history course, you learned about the Two-Spirit tradition, which is evident among many Native American and First Nations peoples. They believe that, in some individuals, their body simultaneously held the spirits of both males and females. Thus, many Native groups recognized four genders, the historically traditional feminine female and masculine male, but also feminine male when someone born biologically male lives as a gendered female, and masculine female when someone born biologically female lives as a gendered male. Two spirits were not shunned from their communities. In fact, they often took on roles specific to their gender presentation. For instance, masculine females could become warriors. Two spirits also married and participated in all aspects of traditional community life. And it isn't just non-Western peoples like Native Americans where we see historical examples of individuals who might be called, in today's vocabulary, transgendered. In the 18th century, Charles Genevieve de Beaumont worked as a spy for his native French government between 1756 and 1765. At times, for his undercover work, he dressed as a woman. In 1774, nine years after retiring from service, de Beaumont demanded to be recognized legally as a woman. In court documents, she said that she'd actually been born female and had been pretending to be male her whole life so that she could inherit family property. The conservative French government, led at the time by Louis XVI, granted her request in 1777, but only if she agreed to dress accordingly for the rest of her life. She complied, and for the remaining 33 years of her life was known as Le Chevalier de Yon. She did eventually lose her lands, but then almost everyone did during the French Revolution, and she retired to England, where she lived the last years of her life with another woman. Upon her death, her corpse was examined by doctors. They concluded that she had been biologically male, but that certain, quote, feminine characteristics, including rounded limbs and noticeable breasts, were evident. It's possible that Le Chevalier was intersex, someone who was born with a combination of both male and female sexual organs. Modern science continues to provide insight into our ideas of biological sex and gender. For instance, we know that some people are born intersex. Now it's time for evolutionary scientists to figure out why nature might select for intersex genes. Through neuroscience and psychology, we also know that some people are transgendered and not just homosexual, as earlier studies had concluded. And finally, we're realizing that both sex and gender are actually mutable. A person's gender certainly doesn't have to match their biological sex, and a transgender person can use pharmacological interventions to change their hormones and physically present as their preferred gender if they so choose. The main lesson here then is that biological science and psychology work together to help us understand the human organism just a little bit better.